Well, I'm delighted to introduce our second speaker, and I uh, thought it was a real home run the first hour, and no pressure or anything for the second hour, but uh, we're off to a good start, and we rejoice in that. And uh, it's my delight to introduce John Voicey. This is my first time ever to introduce John, his first time to visit us here at Austin Bible Church. Um, I feel in many ways uh, John and I are twins because we have so much in common in terms of military background, military police, law enforcement, things of that nature. We, we resonate in a lot of things, and that's just in the earthly realm. <coughs> then we start talking doctrine and scripture and everything else, and man, it's like we really are twins. Appreciate that in many ways. Um, you have, uh, I should have highlighted that if you have the conference brochure, then you have all of the photographs. The, these are the human photographs, not the uh, armored up angelic photographs that are down front. Uh, but you have the bios in here and some of the background. Uh, father of seven, grandfather of four. That's, and uh, I noticed the ordination date and the pastor date. Some of these churches, Mike Smith's another one, some of these men are pastoring prior to their ordination. And uh, there's a story there, and it's, uh, it's a blessing, and, and things that Mike shared a little bit when he was with us last time, and has spotted this here as well, with respect to uh, being pastor of Grace Doctrine Church, Tampa Bay, Florida, from 03 to present. Last thing I'll say is that uh, we want to thank you for sending us Al and Deb Doughty, and uh, if you want to send us seven or eight more Al and Deb Doughty's, uh, please feel free to send all the Al and Deb Doughty's you'd like to send. Their tickets are paid for. They're coming back with me. Oh, no. No, no, no. Okay. Bring us the word, please. Not them with food. You can't have them back. Uh, a word of serious note here before I begin. Um, this morning, I'm, <clears throat> as being a chaplain, I am always have my ear to the, to the rails with regard to the death or injury of an officer. And this morning I received an email from a service I, that I uh, subscribed to and uh, they let me know that a local law enforcement officer was killed last night, uh, Lieutenant Clay Crabb of the Austin Police Department was killed in a car crash last night and today he would have been 43 years of age. Uh, Clay uh, left behind his wife and uh, three children ages 11, 8 and 4. And if you would uh, be so kind as to list them on you, the family on your prayer, uh, uh, the prayer list or whatever list you might have for prayers, so that uh, you might pray for him uh, or pray for his family rather, and um, and uh, maybe even support them in some way. Uh, just bear with me while I get back to my regular screen. Um, but first, the first thing I really wanted to say here uh, today is the fact that um, when. When we uh, get together like this, it's really a joy, but when you stand in front of, um, uh, one moment please, I just, uh, okay, that's better. Uh, when, we, uh, when you stand in front of a, a group of people, uh, that's a whole other venue. I mean, uh, one of the things I look for when I come into a, a building uh, that we call a church, whether it be a home or whatever it is, uh, the, th the first thing I look for is not the building itself and how nice it is and clean. And, and I look for the heart of the church, the heart of the church. What, is the, what are the people like? Uh, because that tells me a lot about the pastor. It tells me a lot about the teaching. And I've seen a lot of heart so far uh, in the few people that I've met so far. So I just uh, want to thank you for that. Um, what I'd like to do, if we would, bow our heads in prayers before I begin, uh, so that we can start in the correct way. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you speak, Lord, for your servants here. Speak now in some message to meet our needs, known only to you. Speak, Lord, and let us see some wonderful truth you desire to show. For it's in our Savior's name we pray. Amen. I want to thank you for having me here at Austin Bible Church. You know it's uh, truly an honor and a privilege to be standing in someone else's pulpit. It's a privilege to do that. And I don't take it lightly uh, whatsoever. Um, in, in the years that I've been pastoring, this is the very first time 
um, I've been asked to speak in someone else's pulpit, so I can guarantee you uh, that at this point, I am very humbled. Um, and I might even say that um, I'm in tall cotton, as it were, with getting to know Ralph Braun and Emo Schmidt and always uh, knowing uh, Mr. Crowder, Pastor Crowder there, Hugh Crowder and Bob Thomas, that he's been at our church. And uh, like I say, I don't take it lightly. Um, so uh, I want to give you a brief overview of what happened and, and how excited I was about being here today. Uh, you see, when I was asked by Pastor Bob to be a part of this conference and, and he informed me who would be filling the pulpit, I thought myself, wow, that's really impressive. Maybe I should take him up on his invitation. Well, the next morning I woke up and I ran out to the kitchen and where my wife was, and of course she was shoeless, and uh, cooking over a hot stove, and I said, Honey, you never believe what happened to me yesterday. I just got a call from Pastor Bob from Austin Bible Church. Do you remember me talking to, to you about him? And she says, Yeah, I, re I remember you talking to him. I, well, I got a call from him, and he wants me to speak uh, alongside some real spiritual giants. I said, honey, there'll be some people from the Republic of Texas. <laughs> and honey, there's going to be some people from over the rainbow somewhere. I said, honey, there'll be PhDs and there'll be THMs and honey, there'll be DDs and there'll be SUVs. <laughs> I said, honey, how many great men do you think there really are in this world? And of course, as women are like they are, she said, I think there's one less than you think there is. <laughs> that, my friend, did not come from Dr. David Noble. He still owes me $25 for that joke. <laughs> so I know some of you have heard it before. <laughs> okay, we'll begin our study this afternoon. Uh, as was asked by your pastor and Pastor Bob to, um, to speak on Romans 6.17 and, and I think of course Ralph brought uh, to our attention and our remembrance by way of the Holy Spirit that we um, take notice and remember those things that we continued in and my thought was, my thinking was well what about those that fall outside that realm of, of teaching once they've heard it? Um, and so a word of encouragement, I guess, is the best way to, to present this. And that is to continue to stake your life on truth. Continue to stake your life on truth. If a man can go to war and can fight a battle for the earthly thing he calls freedom, for the earthly thing he calls home, for the earthly thing he calls his family in the Constitution, he is staking his life on those things that he was raised to understand. He's staking his very life on those very things. So you can also say that this lesson could be called, now I lay me down as sheep, because that's who we are and we do go astray. As a matter of fact, in John 10, 16, as our Lord has said, he says, I have other sheep which are not of this fold, and I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd from the New American Standard. Well, as we understand and we, we uh, exegete the Scripture, we understand that when he was saying there is, I have other sheep, the Gentiles. We have been brought into the fold. We have not been forgotten, and we will never be forgotten. And based on that, we understand that our Lord is always with us. He used the sheep as a term of endearment. So in Romans 6, 17, we read again, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient. You became obedient from the cardia, that form of teaching which you were committed. Now, before we go any further with any uh, looking at uh, uh, definitions or anything else, 
I have a couple of thoughts about those things that which we are committed to. And to remember the doctrines that were taught by the colonel and by other men of God in my life. I have noticed over this past several years that those who call themselves a part of the doctrinal movement have come to a point, not all, not everyone I meet, but I am seeing out in the internet and other places that I talk to people that they're actually arrogant because they believe, like the Pharisees, that they had one up on everybody else. The arrogance. It is almost cult-like in the way they speak. And I just want to give a word of warning. And I don't see that here at all. I'm just saying what I've seen. And I'm a newbie. I've only been around this for 14 or 15 years. But I do take note. It's a part of who I am. I analyze things as a pastor should. It's my background. I'm a former deputy sheriff. I investigated things. So I look at things with, the, with a, a, a whole set of lenses on, and I look at it and I say, well, something's not right here. Why is this? Well, in most cases, I would say 99% of the cases, it is the person in the pew, the congregation. But then also I've noticed that there are pastors in this doctrinal movement that have taken 1 John 1, 9 and ran it off its rails. They have ran it off its rails, telling the congregations in their teaching that they can sin and confess and sin and confess. Antinomian at best. So let's take a look here. You became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And as I looked at that, it's, to me it's a statement by the Apostle simply implies responsibility to continue. You know, the form of uh, teaching that Paul had in mind was the teaching that our Lord Jesus Christ himself gave during his earthly ministry. And then through the Apostles, of course, and in contrast to the Mosaic Law. But God had not forced Paul's readers to yield to that law yet. They had willingly embraced it as the law for themselves. They had committed themselves to it from their hearts. But Paul was not stressing the fact that the Lord had comment, com uh, committed his teachings to his reading, uh, readers, as the uh, authorized version says, but that they had committed themselves to it. We see that word continue. And I looked it up in Webster's. And by the way, I don't use modern English dictionaries any longer. You can't. Webster's 1828. To remain in a state or place, to abide for any time indefinitely, to last, to be durable, to endure, to be permanent, to persevere. Words familiar to the Christian way of life. To be steadfast or constant on any course. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples. Our Lord has taught us, as the word says. Then there's a word, abide. Abide. To rest or to dwell. To tarry or to stay for a short time. To continue permanently or in the same state. To be firm and immovable. Or to remain and to continue even in rest, even in rest, as we shall see. In 1 John, John writes, as for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. Well, what did they hear in the beginning? They heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, him crucified, buried, raised from the dead, from the dead on the third day, sitting at the right hand of God the Father. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. The word meno. The word meno. In 1 John 2, 20, or excuse me, 1 John 2, 24 and 25, there are signs there of living in the light. 
John called his readers to abide to the true doctrine of Jesus Christ to enable them to abide in fellowship with God. Christians should not reject that truth they believe that resulted in their salvation. It's a warning, such as in Hebrews. But such faithfulness to us to continue to abide is that fellowship with God. We can't do it on our own. We realize that, or most of us realize, we cannot do it on, the, on our own. But as the, John wrote here, and he uses abide three times, the Greek word meno, it's a primary verb, by the way, to stay, to endure, to be present, to stand. And he gives us this information for a reason. He also gives us the word continue. Continue is the same word meno. Then there's the word prosmeno, ammeno, epimeno, depending on the verse that I've verses that I've given you here. But what does it really mean to abide and to continue or to stay with what you've begun? When you're in the military, as Pastor Bob can attest to, you can't just walk off and walk out the door because times are tough. You stick it out. And when you've learned how the bullets fly over your head and how to duck and cover, how to keep your buddies back, you can't run off. This week we honored a army captain with the highest decoration of all that we could give in the United States, and that was the Medal of Honor. Because that young captain carried his, one of his men who was bleeding to death by the neck to a, a waiting helicopter, kissed him on the forehead, and didn't think he'd see him again. At least that man got to see his wife the last time. So continue, because the battle is strong. Continue. John 8, 31, so Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples. Does that mean just the opposite, that I'm not a disciple if I'm truly not continuing in his word? A disciple listens to the voice of his teacher and follows the instruction. Many people give lip service to who they say they are and what they are. We are inclined in our sin nature to put on a facade. We are inclined in our sin nature to put on a mask. As a matter of fact, some sheep look like this. <laughs> That's a picture of me, by the way. I'm lost in a group of sheep before I was saved. I was actually a goat, but, but I wasn't ever a wolf. Study came out a little while ago. It said study proves 95% of people really are sheeple. You know what sheeple are, right? Okay. Scientists at the University of Leeds have conducted research that proves the tendency many have to act like sheep unwittingly, following crowds as if they didn't possess a reasoning mind. Does that sound like today or what? I mean, that sums it up right here in our nation now. While this tendency may have its issues in some situations, such as planning pedestrian flow in busy areas, it doesn't inspire a ton of hope for humankind. The studies show that it takes a minority of 5% to influence a crowd's direction and that the other 95% follow without even realizing what is going on. Isn't that interesting? How many people gravitate to the lie versus the truth? How many people would rather swallow the lie than to even look at the truth? I've been uh, confronted in many, in many ways in the last couple of months about this very topic, this idea of truth. And it's always been about God's truth, not my truth. 
in my presentation in the gospel with, with others, and part of my responsibility as a pastor, how I teach and encourage the congregation as I'm required to do. But it goes without saying that we are all sheep and we can all turn away and walk away at some kind. We're not without our flaws. So what do we do? Well, what do we do? We found that in this case, Professor Krauss, who was a PhD, uh, with a PhD student, uh, John Dyer conducted this series of experiments, excuse me, in which groups of volunteers walked randomly around a large mall. Uh, within the group, a few received instructions regarding where to walk, and participants were not allowed to communicate with one another or intentionally inf influence one another. And the findings in all these cases reveal that the informed individuals were followed by the others in the crowd forming a self-organizing type of snake situation in the way they were walking, or like a flock of sheep. Take your pick. But it's interesting how one or two people can influence. One or two pe people can influence. In John 10, 1 through 16, our Lord clearly outlines that truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep but climbs up some other way, he's a thief and a robber. But he who enters the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him, to, to him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Well, what if the shepherd is part of the problem? That may be a case in some situations, unfortunately. And the Lord goes on to say that when he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them. He goes ahead of them. What did, why does he go ahead of them? Because he is the good shepherd. As you see in this picture, it's a sheepfold. And it could be back in the time of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but what Christ was really saying in this passage is, 16 verses, is really reminding the people of what shepherds and sheep act like. Later in the chapter, he makes a more direct application. In the Middle Eastern sheepfold was a very simple stone wall, perhaps about 10 feet high, that surrounded this whole sheep pen. And an opening served as the door. The shepherds in the village would drive their sheep into the fold at nightfall and leave the porter to stand guard. In the morning, each shepherd would call his own sheep, which would recognize his shepherd's voice and come out of the fold. The porter, or the shepherd as it were, would call them and they would follow their shepherd. Isn't that interesting that they know the voice? Christ is the good shepherd for us who dies for the sheep. And as you well know in the Old Testament, sheep died for the shepherd. In the Old Testament, that's what they did. He calls through his word, and those who believe step through the door out of their religious fold and into the true flock of Christ, the church. So now we have some sheep to shepherd. No matter if it's a few or many, we still have a responsibility to continue in doing that. Bear with me while I get this other slide here. Okay. In verse 31 of John 8, he says to continue. We looked at the word continue. He said, continue in my word. Well, that's getting them going back. Why is it doing that? He said, continue in my word. He also says, I say to you, everyone who commits a sin is a slave to sin. But he also said, continue in my word. So, okay, we're, we're going to sin. But it's something significant he says here is that the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain, how, however. So what's the mark of a true disciple is the continuation and the instruction of the teacher, of his or her teacher. The disciple is by definition a learner, not necessarily a believer in the born-again sense, 
You could be a mentor towards someone and not have it be a spiritual principle or a spiritual idea. It's a disciple who remains a disciple as long as he or she continues to follow the instruction of his or her teacher. But does that make you less uh, saved than, than anybody else? No, of course not. When that one stops following faithfully, he or she ceases to be a disciple. He or she does not lose his or her salvation, which comes as a gift from God, as we well know. So what does a good modern-day shepherd look like? Let's get a picture of a modern-day sheep farmer, if we may. Where is it? I keep losing my cursor, and uh, someday I'll find it. <laughs> okay, the diligent sheep man rises early in the morning and goes out first thing, uh, and without fail, to look at his sheep. It is the initial intimate contact of the day with a practiced, searching, sympathetic eye. He examines the sheep to see that they are fit and content and able to be on their feet. In an instant, he can tell if they have been in trouble, if they've been troubled throughout the night at all, whether they are ill or if there is some uh, some which require special attention. Repeatedly throughout the day, he casts his eye over the flock to make sure that all is well. Even at night, he is ob not oblivious to their needs whatsoever. What he does know, that when he goes out and looks at his sheep, they are his responsibility. Even, like I said, even at night, he's not oblivious to it. He sleeps, as it were, with one, one eye open, ready at the least sign of trouble to leap up and protect his own. This is a sublime picture, as you well know, of the care given to those whose lives are under Christ's control, the head shepherd. But this is also the same principle applied to a pastor-teacher to his congregation. Don't think that pastor teachers don't have a rough time with personalities sometimes. They do. That can happen. Or they have to take hold of something they know is not going in the right direction. They do. When they see that a sheep might be getting out of line and going in the wrong direction, you see, when I was first saved, I learned on my own that once you're saved, everything is going to be perfect in life and everybody is going to be nice to me. <laughs> and I'm talking about people in church. <clears throat> what a surprise. What a revelation to find out that Christians can be stinkers. Yes, you and I can be stinkers. But, as it were, we're we, we are still the sheeple, we are still the people that God loves his own. It's like the idea that, blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits, even the God of our salvation, he that keeps you will not sleep. He does not slumber whatsoever. In spite of having such a master and an owner, the fact remains that some Christians are still not content with his control. I heard someone say this morning that they had a problem with authority. Oh, really? Welcome to my club. Because we are all under that, <clears throat> we're under that uh, guise or under that penalty known as the sin nature. But, as I said, this farmer, this sheep farmer, goes around and he had one ewe whose conduct exactly typified the type of person that you would probably say to yourself, well, they might get themselves in trouble. What should I do? Well, let's look at it. Um, these are the people that are somewhat dissatisfied, always feeling like that somehow the grass is 
greener beyond the fence and must be a, a little greener there somewhere. Some people call them carnal Christians. One might call them a fence crawler or half a Christian. I call them fence crawlers myself, but, uh, but who want the best of both worlds. I've had congregation members come to me and, and bring a book to me or uh, something about a new revelation in the Word of God that doesn't belong there, some heresy. These are the types of things I'm referring to as well. These are, these are the types of things that, that pastors have to look out for. Well, this farmer that I'm referring to here, who once owed this sheep, whose conduct was so bad that she kept escaping or trying to escape, and she was the most beautiful sheep that he had, perfect in every way. And she bore uh, lambs, beautiful lambs, for a long time. But that one problem was her escape to get outside that fence. And it became such a problem because of the analogy I used earlier about the 95% following the 5% happened in this situation. That the other sheep were following her right out that gate or right out that hole in the fence. Now, that's why a pastor oversees and listens and watches intently to the sheep he had been called the shepherd. Sometimes people may say, well, that pastor is mean. He told me I can't do this and us. No, listen to the word of God and what he teaches. Listen to the word of God and what he teaches. So because of this, it was the sin unto death for the sheep. The sin unto death because the sheep for one last time invited that whole sinful nature that we have and went outside that, that uh, broken fence again and led other sheep outside that escape route. Well, he couldn't see that this, this, uh, that this sheep would keep doing this. He had no resolve other than to get rid of that one sheep. The sin unto death. And sometimes that's how God works with us because he has to. We forced his hand with respect to that. Now, we have happy sheep. Happy sheep. Probatan, or probinum, as we look at what this sheep is about. Psalm 23, 2. You know, the strange th thing about being a sheep is that we get to relax in the comfort of what God has provided to us, not just material, materially here on earth, but here in the spiritual realm of the Word of God. Bible doctrine. Those things that are developed by a man of God who is willing to teach. There's another interesting, strange thing about sheep, though, that I want to tell you about. The strange thing about sheep is that because of their very makeup, it's almost impossible for them to be made to lie down unless four requirements are met. Owing to their timidity, they refuse to lie down unless, number one, they're free from all fear. They are free from all fear. Paul tells us about this in Romans 8, 15, for you have not received the spirit of fear or slavery, or rather leading to fear again, but to have received a spirit of adoption as a son, which we cry out, Abba, Father. They also have to be fear, uh, free from friction with other, others of the same kind. Have you ever been in a church where there's friction? Well, even with Paul and Barnabas and Mark, Acts 15.31. Look at the conflict there. But Paul, back in Acts 15.38, he says, but Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along who had deserted them in Pamphylia. And there was a conflict there. A conflict that, that uh, only they could work out with their own. So they had to stay in fellowship 
with one another to do what they did. Okay, they have to feel a need uh, of finding food. They have to have the need of food. They have to feel free of friction. They have to be free of uh, fe all fear. Um, because of their social uh, behaviors within the flock themselves, they won't lie down unless those three are met, as well as their physical needs if they're tormented by flies or parasites. Sheep will just not lie down if they're being pestered with those little boogers. Only when they're free of these pests can they relax. Lastly, sheep will not lie down as long as they feel the need for food. And it's significant if you think about it that to be at rest there must be a definite sense of freedom from fear, tension, aggravations, and hunger. And the unique aspect of that picture is that it is only the sheep man himself who can provide all of those things. It's a good analogy. I realize that it's a very simple one, but it's a reminder again of where our rest lies, where we, where we keep our rest so that we can continue and abide in where we're supposed to be in our spiritual life. I'll give you a, uh, Aesop's fable here. It was a wolf meeting with a lamb astray from the fold, resolved not to lay violent hands on him, but to find some plea to justify the lamb to the lamb, the wolf's right to eat him. In other words, he was trying to convince the lamb, please don't, uh, to, uh, I need to eat you. So he's trying to persuade him in his own way. So the, uh, the idea here is that he, he addressed him and, and he said, Sarah, last year you grossly insulted me. Indeed, bleated the lamb in a mournful tone and voice. I was not even born. Then said the wolf, you, you feed in my pasture. He said, no good, sir. He replied to the lamb, I have not yet tasted grass. Again, the wolf said, you drank of my well. No, exclaimed the lamb, I never yet drank water, for as yet my mother's milk is both food and drink to me. Upon which the wolf seized him and ate him up, saying, well, I won't remain supperless, even though you refute every one of my imputations. From Aesop's, uh, Aesop's fables. And in that, we look at the idea of a tyrant. This is the way a tyrant works. The tyrant will always find a pretext for his tyranny. I'm not waxing political here. I'm talking about the spiritual realm. Keep politics outside the door for a moment. The tyranny I'm talking about is a tyranny, a tyranny we may commit. And we're not being persevered. And we're not continuing. We're not abiding. We're not following the master. We're not listening to the pastor. We're not applying Sophia. We're not understanding and learning oida as was pointed out this, mo uh, this morning but to consider these things consider what what the whole idea of the sin nature is about that we become tyrannical in our in our and justifying in what we try to do when we walk away from god but to continue in these things has to be something that is motivated here and our thinking process, and the way that we look at life, and we see as a characteristic of a tyrant, is a cruel and oppressive ruler. And you say, well, that couldn't be me. I could never be that bad in sinning. Oh, yeah? C.S. Lewis once wrote, no man knows how bad he is until he's tried to be good. That was his take on it. So we look at this chapter, verse uh, 17 of, of Romans. I'm not going to go through the whole thing here right now. And we understand that we are sinners saved by grace. We understand Galatians 2.20 and that we were dead with Christ. And that it's important that we know this because it's a crucial to understanding our relationship uh, to sin as believers in Jesus Christ. And that because we do sin, therefore we do know uh, 1 John uh, 1, 9, referred to as rebound. 
by some master teachers. Christian living depends on the Christian learning, and duty is always founded on doctrine. If Satan can keep a Christian ignorant, which is quite a few of us out there in this country, he can keep them impotent. Satan's greatest device is to drive earnest souls back to a uh, to beseeching God for what God has already been uh, has already done in our lives, and God does not have to go back and do what He's already done. What you and I have to do is to stay the course and remember. Yes, we can step aside and and feel our oats as that that uh, lamb did. How many times is God going to allow us to do that? Only He knows. Well, give Him one last chance. As a deputy sheriff, I found that there were families, especially mothers, um, that their sons were arrested so many times and they had a long rap sheet and, and all of that. And, uh, and I, they would ask me, I said, well, would, would you just let him go? And, and not place any charges against them. I said, ma'am, I said, um, you know, I would say to the family that I would not be doing my job the way I was asked to do. Besides, I said, uh, state of Florida, by the way, is I think the only state with, in God you trust in the seal, the state seal. And I would often point to it. I said, besides, ma'am, I would be violating what this says right here, in God we trust. God set up government for a reason. So as a born-again believer and a doctrinal believer, as a deputy sheriff, I had the personal observation of seeing people trying to escape. These were Christian families I'm talking about. Trying to escape what the righteousness of God has already declared that they should be involved in what they should be considering to be obedient from the beginning of when they first believed, the violation of what the Word of God says. And I would often ask them, are you confessed up? Well, what do you mean by confessed up? And John, would you say this in uniform? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would ask them, are you prayed up? Is your family prayed up? And I would ask them, are you assured of your salvation? And they would say, most likely, some answer like, well, we haven't been attending church like we should. I, that's not what I asked you. Are you setting the example? You're the father who says you are a born-again believer. You are the mother who is to follow the father who is a born-again believer. What is your life about? What are you showing the children in your life? Do you know what confession means? Do you know what being prayed up means? You see, I have this silly idea from Matthew 10, 32 and 33. I had a ridiculous idea where our Lord said, therefore, if, anyone, if everyone uh, who confesses me before men, I will confess him before my Father who is in heaven. Just a silly idea I had. But you see, I still had God and trust in my badge. And family members who were Christians needed to know that. And I felt it was my responsibility, even though I was not a, their pastor, I was not their teacher, but I was from the government and I'm here to help you. <laughs> that one I could honestly say, if you think about it. So, as we see here in Romans 6, 11 to 17, there are four key words which indicate the believer's personal responsibility in relation to God's sanctifying work. The first one is to know the facts of our union and identification with Christ in his death and resurrection. And to reckon or count these things as facts to be true concerning ourselves. And then yield or to present ourselves once for all as alive from the dead for God's possession and used for him to obey him in that realization, in that progressive sanctification, so that we can proceed in God's will in our life, as Schofield wrote in the Schofield Bible, Reference Bible, 
page 1217. So we see these things in other areas of our lives, but do, do we experience them ourselves? Well, I don't know about you, but I've, I've experienced these because Paul outlined it even back in his day. As we continue to stake our, attempt to stake our life on truth by God's word and by his power alone, by uh, g great teaching, 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 15, he, Paul writes to Timothy, he says, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. You see, Paul, when he wrote that, difficult times will come. The present tense. But in the continuation of man, in the continuing sense, we're, we say we're, we must be in the last days. We must be. People are going bonkers. They're going silly. They're going crazy. They have no logical thought anymore. That's the fallen world we live in. He said, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of self, and so on and so on. Evidence of faithlessness in a world on mad. How would you like to live in an asylum where nobody gets the medication but you? How would you like to be in an asylum where everybody else has gone bonkers and is free to do anything they want, free reign to do whatever they want, and the authorities around you say, oh, it's okay, we're just going to justify it because this sin, it can be justified by this, or this uh, crime can be justified by this. Well, no, let's write some more laws because the laws that pertain to this don't really aren't effective anymore because we couldn't get to those people that really didn't understand it that time, so now we got new laws. It's, it's crazy. It's gotten out of control, but it's not our control to have. It's not our control to have. So therefore, we do not concern ourselves with the last days. We concern ourselves with ourselves, by ourselves, to only one person. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He said that. How's my time? Anybody know? Okay. So I got about 10 minutes? You said I could go over? Okay. We'll, we'll stick around till 6. Then. How's that? <laughs> Take time. Okay. Okay. We mentioned the four key words, but I'm not going to get into the Greek now uh, at this point because of, the, um, because of what I have here. You and I are to continue on for one very great reason. And that's one thing that I think Ralph touched on, and that is the position of the father with, relations, with relationship to the, the born and believer, his church. He touched on that because uh, the Holy Spirit knew that these are the things that I have started our church on. When I asked individuals, now think about this for a minute, we're talking about churched people. When I asked our congregation about the Father and the relationship to the believer, very few, and these were doctrinal believers, my friends. I don't know from what vantage point they came from or whatever. None of them could really describe what that relationship was. And the reason why I looked at it that way is because I looked at society as a whole as to not just unbelievers, but believers. I, I looked at believers more than unbelievers because I had the opportunity to talk to people on several occasions. I arrested a young man and was in Bible college one time. And um, uh, I arrested him for drunk driving. And he's in the back seat of my, crying, uh, my car and he's crying. He's about 19, 20 years old. And he was going to Clearwater Christian College in our local area, where uh, 
Billy Graham went to that school. And um, <laughs> he's in the back seat and he's, he says, I can't believe you're, you're taking me to jail. I said, well, believe it. I said, are you a Christian? Like, do you know your Christ is your personal savior? He says, yeah. I said, well, then you know that when you do wrong, God is there to help you. He sent me to be the messenger. He sent me to be the one to help you in your situation. I got to talk with him for quite a time, for quite a long time, and help him understand some theology that he was a little messed up on. But the bottom line is this, that even though we go astray and we look for something else, we go try to go outside the, the normal parameters or just want to walk away from God. And by the way, I don't know if you're aware of it, but that's how, uh, according to what I heard personally with my own ears, is the way John MacArthur got started with the Lordship Salvation. Uh, he had a friend, a college friend, who walked away from Christ, and he felt that was terrible. Bottom line is, he's still saved. The bottom line is that young man, I don't know where he is today in his life, I hope he's preaching somewhere or doing something for the Lord. But the whole idea here is that we need to understand where we fit in by ourselves, between us and God, when you look in the mirror, by what we say and what we do and how we act should comport with what we believe always comport with what we believe and what we say we believe. If our words and our actions don't match up, there is something askew. You've tried to run the fence. You may be a fence crawler. Be careful. Because once you get started on that fence crawling deal, it's an easy way, easier way to look for a way out. Oh, I don't need to go to church anymore. I don't need to be with fellow Christians anymore. I don't need to do this or that anymore. I've had one or two people leave our congregation and just as Ralph had indicated, you say goodbye. And I try to find out the reason uh, because I'm a nosy pastor. Well, Bob's a nosy pastor, too, so that's okay. Uh, and um, they just don't want to go to church anymore. Just shrug the shoulders. Don't want to do this anymore. Fine. I said, um, remember the warnings. Remember the warnings from Scripture. Take them to heart. Please consider something in your spiritual life. Consider something. So we are to look at that with a, uh, a warning view. Okay. What, what Paul did to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 15, he instructed Timothy concerning what God had revealed would take place in the last days. And, that, and we say we're seeing those today. But he did so to help him realize that he faced no unknown situation in Ephesus and to enable him to combat it intelligently. To combat what he was seeing. Evidences of faithlessness. Paul had given Timothy some of the, uh, the, the instruction concerning, concerning the apostasies of the last days in the first epistle that was in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3. He gave much more the last days refers to the days preceding the Lord's return for his own, the rapture. And they're obviously not last because of our deaths here on earth. But the whole idea here, and you, you're well aware of this, that our Lord, when he spoke to, to the, the believers, the few who were believers, he spoke to them in terms of the times in which they lived. And they understood it. Paul was teaching uh, Timothy in the time in which he lived. And he, and he believed it, he understood it. Consider one fact here. Remember, um, if, you, if you know your, your church history, the first century church, 
what was going on in the first around the first century church as a culture. It was a, a, a paganistic society, but there was other things going on <clears throat> in that paganism. There was a lot of <clears throat> a lot of uh, sensuality and sexuality going on. It was the Greek culture that was in there. That <clears throat> quite a few things that were <clears throat> destroying or could destroy the church. And some of these people have come out of that. They have come out of that lifestyle. They've come out of that way of thinking. And when Paul wrote in Romans 12, 1 and 2 about changing the mind, reforming and renewing the mind, I think in Romans, above all things, that these are the things that the Christians today should take advantage of. If there's something askew in, in the person's life, they should really uh, take a look at what's going on in their personal life. Confession may be involved. However, the thing that distracts us most in our lives, the thing that distracts us most in our personal life, is the fact that the world is crumbling around us. Paul's writing here concerning the things to combat intelligently the things that he's seeing in the times in which they live. So too, I'm sure Pastor Bob is, is doing the very same thing. He's raising up men of God to do the same thing as well. If you consider these the last days, if that's your theology, if that's what you were taught, if that's what you think because you're seeing things go on around the world and in our nation, well, consider first your relationship, your intimacy, your being a sheep among, among the, uh, uh, the people. Uh, among the, or excuse me, the sheep among, among the people of God in the congregation under the head shepherd, Jesus Christ. And finally, as I close this afternoon, Philippians 1 6, Paul says, For I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. That's a question mark for some people, a big question mark. Maybe that was Paul's confidence to the Philippian believers, but in the day in which we live, it could be a cautioned question mark. Will you abide? Will you continue to that which became obedient from the heart, to that form of teaching, teaching to, to which you were committed? I don't know. And please, don't, uh, I, I say don't. I, when I say don't, I'm, I'm, it's, it's a cautionary thing. Uh, but don't find yourself in a situation where, well, if something happened to me and they said, it's either die or Christ. Um, uh, I know what I would say. You haven't a clue. You haven't a clue. But people are losing their heads for Christ. Pray for them. Pray for them. Pray for the martyrs that stay to the end because they gave their life rather than go to some other religion. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you that you have given us freedom, even freedom here this afternoon. You've allowed us to gather together based upon men's blood that was shed on foreign shores. And we praise and thank you for that freedom. But most of all, Father, we thank you for the blood that was shed on the cross. For what he did for us, or your Son, our Savior, what he continues to do through the word. <clears throat> and Father, what he does through those pastor teachers who are committed to persevere and to continue to that which they were taught. We pray this thing in Christ's name.
Amen. Thank you, sir. I regret that I was unable to explain the laptop. It's far too new to me. Thieves break in and steal. Moth and rust destroys. And uh, we... Uh, we learned about that in the recent uh, couple of months. So this is a brand new machine for me, and I'm still learning the different features on it and different things. In any event, thank you. Appreciate the blessings. Um, we're going to dismiss at 4.30, so we have about 16 minutes remaining. And uh, we're not going to take another break, because if I cut you loose, I won't get you back in here. And so we'll just... Uh, fence, fence walkers? The, the fence crawlers. Crawlers, that's it. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to keep you in here at least till 4:30, and then we'll uh, we'll bust you loose until 7:30. Uh, Come back at 7:30. So.